Okay, now what is the sermon about today? What did the Holy Spirit come up with today? There it is, spinning around. First word we're going to talk about is lost. It was funny, when I thought about that word lost, first thing I thought about was when I was a child. Anybody as a child been lost? You know, you get lost. Amen. It's a very scary thing to be lost. You know, brings a lot of fear into your heart. And, and, and that's the first kind of loss. And when you're, when you're lost like that, the point is, you know you're lost. Okay? You know you don't know where you are and how to get to wherever you need to be. So you know you're lost. You're a child. And children are great because, you know, they see things clearly. Now, there's another type of loss. That's the one that we kind of get into when we're adults. You know? We don't know we're lost, you see, but we are. And, you know, in the world, we call that, when I was coming up, we, we would call it being on a mission, you know. Some people say you're on a run. You know what being on a run means? Everything's going your way. What you're setting out to accomplish, you're meeting that demand. You're reaching all them goals that you set up for yourself. You know, everything you touch turns to gold. You know, start thinking you got the Midas touch. Anybody remember the Midas touch? Everything you touch turns to gold. You know, you're on a run. You know, some people out there are on a mission. They're not really concerned about achieving anything. They're just out there knowing they're having a good time. And they're not worried about nothing else but that pleasure and that good time. And they enjoying every single second of it. They loving it. You see? But guess what? They're lost. They are truly lost. And I know we can, you know, kind of identify with that. Because I think I've been on all three of them. Maybe some more. I don't know. I can't think of any other ones. But anyway. So now, what wakes us up and lets us know that we're lost? Because we can be on a run, getting everything we want, everything we touch turns to gold, we demand. You know, we can be out there enjoying things, not even care about anything, and have the, as we say on the street, the efforts. We don't care, we having fun. You know. There's a second one. <laughs> you know, two points. That was a three-point shot. Loss. It's the loss that we suffer that lets us know that we are lost. Because you see, when you're on that run, when you're out there, you know, turning everything into gold, when you're out there having a good time, you know, and everything's, you know, about pleasure and seeking pleasure, guess what? Eventually, you're going to suffer some loss. Now the little kid that's lost, they come to the realization quite quickly that what used to work as far as finding their way, way where they needed to be or what they used to rely on, you know, how they used to try and control things and how things would work out so it would always, always you know, be the right thing for them and they get back to where they needed to be, they realize that they've lost control. What used to work from their standpoint as far as what they needed to do, it's not working anymore. They done tried to find their way back then and looked at it this way, tried all sorts of ways trying to figure it out, and guess what? Doesn't work. So now, they're lost, and they're afraid. Now the older people, you know, out there you know, on the run and doing whatever, on a mission, now all of a sudden now, they're going to start losing their finances. That's one of the things we can lose and wake us up a little bit. Money get a little low. Next thing we can start losing, we can start losing jobs. We can start losing our homes. We can lose our cars. You know, all the material possessions that we put so much, you know, emphasis on and that we get very easily get attached to. Sometimes they become our identity, the way we identify ourselves. You know, we can start losing all of that. Then we start losing relationships 
friends, wives, all sorts of relationships start to disintegrate. Things start going bad. Sometimes we lose a loved one. That's the worst loss, that loved one. And you know when it stinks, when you lose that loved one? You know they're in a better place. You know they're with Jesus. But you're lonely. And you're also mad at yourself, upset with yourself. Because while you were so preoccupied with yourself, while you were turning in everything into gold, while you were enjoying all the pleasures of life and trying to conquer fun, which Kenny always told me you can't do, but you'll try, okay? While you was busy doing all that, focusing on you, there was somebody that was more important than all the things you were doing. And now they're gone. And you realize all that time you spent on that mission, all that time you spent on that run, it was wasted. And you regret every moment of it. Because now you've been brought to your knees. Because you realize the loss of all of that self-seeking, self-preoccupied behavior only leads you to that point where, you know, you start to realize that, you know what? It wasn't worth it. And not only that, you start getting mad at yourself. You start regretting all the things you did. Then you start feeling sorry for yourself. And I don't mean like pity, sorry for yourself, but y'all know what I'm talking about. You start feeling really bad and sorry about all the things you did wrong. You know, sometimes you can do something and you know it's the wrong thing. You know if you get caught or if it turns out the way you know it could turn out, it's not going to be good. But you go ahead and you do it anyway. I don't know why we do that. That the flesh just make you do it anyway. And then the consequences come up and jump up on you. And there you are. Preoccupied with what you want to do. Suffer the loss. And now you're feeling bad. Why did I do that? You stop feeling sorry for yourself. And the next thing that happens to you, now you won't give up. You see, you want to give up. Because your heart has been broken. Your spirit has been broken. Because you realize, boy, oh boy, I really messed things up now. What am I going to do now? Well, Everybody in this room knows what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to come on to the Lord. Because guess what? There's some unconditional love waiting for you in the Lord. And that's the best time to go to the Lord for that unconditional love. But this is what trips people up when they go see, when they come to the Lord. You see, things never happen fast enough for us when we're in that run and we're out there doing things according to our agenda. You see? And like I said before, sometimes we want to get mad at God because we don't pick out all these things we're going to do. You know, and they're good things in our mind. We're not doing anything wrong. We're not breaking any rules. We're helping people out. You know, but we get mad because you know, we want God to sign off on our plan. And when he doesn't sign off on our plan, we get upset. You know, something wrong with God. Because I'm doing these good things out here. I'm helping people. And I got this plan in place. Now why won't he give me what I want? Well, you see, it's not about God signing off on what you want. It's about you sitting down and realizing that all that stuff that you were caught up in, as far as how you had your plan and, and your strategy and how it was working so well for some time, or maybe it wasn't and you weren't paying attention, and, all the things you lost and you're not in control because nothing's working right. Guess what? It's time. What is insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. We all know that. So what's happening now? It's a new time now. It's time for a change. It's time to find a new way. But Jesus is there waiting for you. But this is the hardest part for people when they come to Jesus. 
You see, you got to learn how to wait on the Lord. You see, God has His own pace. And it ain't got nothing to do with what we think should happen, when we think it should happen, or how it should happen. We got to learn to wait on the Lord. That means be still, chill out, don't try and make a move, don't find something, you know, honorable that you can go back on a mission for or go on a run with and just think because it has to do with Jesus, maybe evangelizing or whatever it is you can come up with in your mind. Be straight out the Bible, but don't think just because it's good and it's coming from the Bible, it's going to run at your pace. The first thing we got to do is learn to wait on the Lord. And that is the hardest thing for all of us to get in our spirit. All of us wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. You know, it takes courage to sit there and wait on the Lord. When you got the world telling you, well, can you see him? What's he doing for you? Well, you know, I would have done this and I would, you know, are you sure? You know, because God helps those who help themselves. Oh, where in the Bible is that scripture? Because I ain't seen it yet. Okay? That's something we come up with, you know, to minimize and justify and do all these things. Be of good courage, you know. Wait on the Lord. You already got a broken heart, even if you don't know it. Your spirit's already broken. You know, you're defeated. The world has defeated you. And he shall strengthen your heart. While you're waiting on the Lord, he's doing his work. You see, God don't need our help. He don't need us to do anything. He can have the stones stand up and worship him. He does not need us for anything. But guess what? He loves us. He loves us so much, I forget the sermon. We can't even figure out or understand how much this, this God loves us. We have no idea how much he loves us. Because all we can equate it to is how we love. And how we love is, isn't even a tenth of a tenth of a tenth of a percent. Robert, you could probably give me a small number, some kind of, you know, but you get my point. We don't know how much God loves us. But while we're finding the courage to trust in something we can't see, we can't touch, and to believe in that, guess what? The Lord's going to strengthen your heart. Because in the beginning, for courage, you don't have the strength. You don't have the belief. You're wavering. But if you have the courage to just do it, when you don't understand why you don't, when you don't really believe it 100%, if you have the courage to just believe, the Lord's going to strengthen your heart. And when he strengthens that heart, guess what? Once again, see, you know, one, I used to look at sermons and listen to sermons and say to myself, why is he saying the same thing over and over and over again? How many times are you going to say that point? Well, guess what? That's what it takes for us humans to get it to sink in. Sometimes we got to hear it a hundred, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand times. Maybe on the nine hundred, nine thousand, nine hundred and ninety ninth time, it might finally sink in. So he said it again. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That's the hardest step. But you've got to have courage to do it. And the Lord's going to build up your heart. And it's funny how it works out when you're giving a sermon. You know the Holy Spirit's working. Because I don't tell Sherry what scriptures to read. I tell her, don't even tell me. Because I know the Lord gave it to you. In a way that is going to make sense of what I'm talking about. Because he's telling me what to say up here. Second Corinthians verse chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. And he said to me, he point there. He, meaning God, this is Paul talking. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul was complaining to him about how he had this bad eye or something. Now, just like we like to complain and ask God to take things away, and it's okay. But guess what? God put a, put a new, different twist on it because it's different than what the world says. My grace is sufficient for you. God's love and forgiveness is sufficient for us. 
For my strength, God's strength, is made perfect in weakness. Psalm 105, verse 4. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face evermore. You ever wonder what that means to seek the Lord's strength? Guess what? God just told you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You see, we have to understand that we are all broken children. None of us are ever going to be complete. None of us are ever going to reach perfection. No matter how many houses, cars, money, whatever you want to come up with, friends, no matter what we have, what we accomplish, what we do, none of us are going to have the strength that we need and the purpose that we need. That comes from the Lord. And His strength is looking for the broken person. His strength is looking for the defeated person. His strength is looking for the lowly person. That's who He's looking for. Psalm 38, verse 17 and 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and He saves such as those with a contrite heart. He's going to come near to you in that moment of crisis. But you've got to be humble. you got to understand, you know, you're not a victim. You had a part in the crisis. You see? And then don't go about saving you. Because you're going to be hopefully humble enough to wait on You'll have the courage to call out his name when you need it. He'll strengthen your heart. Okay? And he lets you know also that guess what? I want you weak. I want you broken. Okay? My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So what did Paul say? Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that's my sickness, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. So Paul went around and told everybody just how broken he was, how weak he was. He didn't care about it. He enjoyed all those infirmities because he knew the more weakness and sickness he carried, the more the power of Christ would rest upon him. Therefore, went on to say, I take pleasure in infirmities. Pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake. Because there's no other way to get the power of Christ but through all of that. For when I am weak, he knew it. Amen. Then I am strong. You see, that's what I'm talking about. Waiting. Understand your condition was planned. It's the only way to receive the power of God. We got to learn to rely on God for everything. We got to learn to put our focus every moment of the day on the Lord. We got to remember that the only place that Jesus and God is dwelling is in that moment and he's there holding our hand every step of the way. You can come up with whatever plan you have for the next day, whatever strategy for the next day. You can come up with all your ways of figuring it out and all your best laid plans and everything else. But guess what? Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what's going to happen 30 days from now, a year from now, 10 years from now. And nobody can control it. Why do we spend all this time worrying about all of that and thinking about all of that? We need to be in the moment with Jesus, holding his hand and talking to Jesus. And holding tight and looking at him and focusing every thought we have as much as we can on the Lord. Now some people are going to sit there and say, well, you're, you're, you're obsessing, you're a cult or you're whatever. You know, that's just the world's nonsense. You know, Sherry talked about, you know, feeding on, on milk and solid food, you know, that's what Paul was saying. You know, we're called to be ministers, teachers. But yet he was saying, you know, we keep going over the same thing over and over again. You know, you know, the, the salvation from Christ. I mean, granted, that's step number one. But you know, we gotta stop, you know, focusing, you know, staying on that lesson and grow up and start eating some of this solid food here. That was a two-point shot. Psalm 32, 8. 
This is what God says while you're waiting on When you got all these ailments and things that make you rely on Him more. So you can gain His power and His strength. He says, I will instruct you, God, and teach you in the way you should go. You know, Psalm, what is it, Proverbs uh, 3, verse 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord of all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will direct your path. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. While you're waiting on Him, but guess what you got to do? I will guide you with my eye. You see, He didn't say He was going to guide you with your eye. He said, I'm going to guide you with my eye. Because I know what the plan is. I know what the purpose is. I know what's going to happen. Y'all done did it your way. You was on your run. You was on your mission. You suffered loss because you were lost. But I'm the great shepherd. You are my sheep. I'm coming to shepherd all of you and bring you home. You know, and the loved ones that we care about that hurts us. You know, Jesus knows you're hurt for a loved one. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? There's two words. I don't know where it is, but it's Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And that was referring to the time when Lazarus, his friend, had died. And when he got the news that Lazarus had died, Jesus wept. He knows your pain. He knows your suffering. He knows how you're feeling. Come to him. Go to him. Let him know. Ask him to comfort you during the crisis. But above all, you will be led by God's eye. And if someone's leading me by their eye, what am I going to do? Where am I going to keep my eye? I'm looking at him. I ain't going to be standing around because I might get scared of what I see. I might see something scare me. So, so I'm going to keep my eye on Jesus. Say, Jesus, yeah, you got this. I'm going to look at you, okay? I'm going to focus on you. So you can get me through whatever it is I need to get through. Because guess what? There's going to be some surprises. There are going to be some change, some challenges out there. Look at what James says. Talking about the challenges in life. Why we got to God, why we got to do all this hard stuff? Can't we just have an easy little path here? You know, I love you. I praise your name. I do anything you want. Can you find a nice easy path for me, please? <laughs> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that testing of your faith produces patience. And what is the one thing that we need in order to learn to wait on the Lord and not act on our own and screw it all up? We need patience. So that's why we go through the trials and tribulations. Because we haven't learned to wait on the Lord. We keep wanting to go out there running full steam. Okay, Lord, I got it. I'm ready. Give me the ball. I'm ready. And then we just want to take off. Enthusiasm. It's a good thing. But guess what? No. Slow down. You know, Lord's taking his time back there. Come on. Okay, Lord. You're taking a long time, Lord. I seem like I see a touchdown straight ahead. See, but, you know, our vision ain't like the Lord's vision. We don't know. We see a touchdown and Satan got a trap set for us. You see? And you got to remember how you did it in the past and it didn't work. So this time, I'm just going to look at Jesus. I'm going to hold his hand. Okay, Jesus, let's go. Like a little kid. But that's what God wants. For his children. That's what he wants. Now, you may not agree with it, but... I don't know what to tell you. But let patience have its perfect work 
See, patience can work a perfect work inside of you, that you may be perfect and complete in lacking nothing. It's when you gain that patience, you have the ability to wait on the Lord. You have the ability to sit there, and while your flesh is screaming in your head or doing whatever it wants to do, pulling you in whatever direction, okay, you have the knowledge and the strength to know that you're going to slow it down and you're going to wait on the Lord. And you're going to look at his eye and know that he got it all figured out. Now some people think, think that, you know, after all that, they say, well, what am I supposed to do? Carry out your duties. You got a job? Go to your job. Everybody got things to do. We all got things we got to do. You got to clean your house, take care of your kids, cook food. We all got things to do. Carry out your duties. Know and focus on the Lord every moment of the day. When whatever comes your way that's a surprise or looks difficult, keep your eye on Jesus. Know he's going to prepare you to get through it. You ain't got to go back to your memory and try and recant all the things that didn't work out and then don't think you got to do something to change the course of action so it don't happen again. You know, that's, that's nonsense. That's in your own head. You ain't got to sit there and worry about what's going to happen. Boy, we can sit there and worry up a storm. I'll do it myself. And we know it ain't working. We're just trying to get control of something that we can't control. Worrying ain't going to help. It's just going to get you all tense and take away your joy and have you possibly do something. Well, better yet, you're going to miss the answer. You're going to miss the direction because you're looking somewhere else and you're not looking at Jesus. And you're going to miss the path. And you're going to have more trials and more tribulations and consequences and everything else. And like Paul said, you just on that milk. You're feeding on that milk. You know, you get it a little bit, but you keep doing the same old thing over and over again. And guess what? God got all the patience in the world. He'll wait for you. But he knows that once you get it, now he can use you. He can use you for his purpose. You see, you're fireproof now. You're fireproof now. Your faith is rock solid. You understand patience. You embrace the trials and tribulations because you know the spiritual blessing is in there. You know that's God telling you where you're falling short. And you need to work a little hard. You need to examine it a little different. You know, you don't have to sit there and constantly evaluate yourself and stand in judgment of yourself. Because when you do that, you start looking at other people. And when you start looking at other people, some of them you're going to come to the conclusion you're better than and you're going to be prideful, which is Satan's greatest tool. And the other ones, you're going to say, well, damn, I can't do what he did. Look at him. He's amazing. Then you start feeling inferior. That's all nonsense thinking. It don't get you nowhere. You can take a look from the lesson of the Lord in the moment and see where you're weak, examine, and work on becoming stronger in that weakness. But you got to rely on what? On the power of the Holy Spirit to pull you through. So you got to pray. That's how this thing works. And in the end, that was another three-porter right here. John 6, John, uh, verse 12, 13. He said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. You see, when we start eating on that steak, now we can help the Lord to gather up the fragments of the ones that are still lost. Now he can use us to make sure nobody's left behind. No one stays lost in his suffering. And as you focus on carrying out your duties while you're focusing on God, now you start, you know, and you put 150% effort into everything you do for the Lord, and you realize that the Lord put the governments in place, and the leaders in place, and the bosses in place, He put them there. So you don't get mad at them or question whatever's going on. You just humble yourself and find a lesson to be learned and create a new you through the power of the Holy Spirit, something you couldn't do before. And when you're eating that solid food, now you start looking at, well, how can I help other people? 
if I can stay in the moment and not be preoccupied with all my stuff, maybe I can actually listen to people and see people and see that they're not doing well. I can hear that they're not doing well, and maybe I can get about helping them. You see, that's the Lord's work. Don't think for one second the Lord's going to redeem you, deliver you, and restore you. And it's all because, you know, so you can have a nice family, a nice home, and pay all your bills, and la, 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 la. That doesn't make any sense. He's going to use us to build his kingdom. He's going to bless us with, you know, material things and everything else. But don't get attached to him. Don't let him take your focus off the Lord. You know? I mean, that's, that's, that's a big mistake. But once again, now we start helping people. And now we have that joy of the Lord that no storm can interfere with. You know? Now we start saying to ourselves, you know what? I can't wait till I get to heaven. You know? I can't wait. You know, we hear, but I can't wait. You know? And the loved ones that have passed, we know they're in heaven. And we're happy for them. Because we know they're in a much better place than we are. And we know we're going to see them one day. You know what I mean? And I'm going to tell you the God's honest truth for all you that think you let somebody down. Okay? There are moments in your life when someone will speak a word to you. And that word that's coming to you is like it's coming from your mother, your father, whoever it was. And they're telling you, it's okay. God got you. I'm happy up here. You know, I'm good. Fight the good fight. And I'll be waiting for you. I'll be looking to see you. And I love you. God bless you. Amen.